Hello, if you're listening, welcome to our weekly Facebook Live Like a Shark Ocean Action Series. Not a boring webinar, it's Ocean Action. This is number 12, week 12. Uh, we've been doing these during COVID. And if you don't know me, hi, I'm David McGuire. I'm the director and founder of Sharp Stewards. We're a project of the Earth Island Institute in Berkeley. And now we're streaming from the field. This is our second week from the laptop. We were out of the apartment in San Francisco. We've been going diving. I went swimming in the ocean yesterday, but we're still being safe. We're still wearing our masks. <laughs> we're keeping our fins clean. We're keeping our social distance and we're always smiling like this guy, like this guy. So we have special guests today. This, this uh, episode is on California marine protected areas. Last week, we talked about international marine protection during World Oceans Week, and we celebrated a new hope spot in Timor-Leste that Shark Stewards has been involved with. We hope to return COVID, uh, COVID allowing us a flight back to, to Singapore, to uh, Indonesia, and to Timor-Leste to continue working in shark protection and creating marine protected, protected areas with local people and governments in the Coral Triangle. So I, I want to introduce our guests without any further ado. Brian Baird, an old friend, beginning to be old friend, a former ga fellow gaucho, gaucho from yep. UC Santa Barbara, surfer, look at that lightning bolt, classic board back there. But Brian has a deep history in marine protection. You started at the Coastal Commission after your guitar gig on the cruise ships, right? Yep, that's right. <laughs> and yeah, Brian <laughs> also was uh, under Secretary Laird, the uh, Under Secretary of the, I didn't write it down, Environment, oh, Assistant Secretary of Ocean and Coastal Policy. And then more recently, he was, uh, did the Coast and Ocean Lecture Series that we worked with, and it was an ocean policy advisor for the Aquarium of the Bay in San Francisco. And then the federal, he was the chair of the federal advisory, Marine Protected Area Federal Advisory Committee and president of the Coastal State Stewardship Foundation. Wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of uh, agencies. You clearly ha must have lower blood pressure now that you're <laughs> retired or semi-retired because here you are on our Ocean Action Series. Absolutely. And then real briefly, I just want to give a shout out to Nicole Palma, who is uh, with the California Marine Protected Area collaboration and she's going to talk about citizen science about this network of mpas under the california mlpa and how you can get involved so welcome nicole thanks for joining us Hi, and uh me. great picture back there that that's on a forest that's a kelp forest isn't it uh, no it's just a okay. forest it's well, my well, attempt it a at a virtual background uh, my computer doesn't do that so uh, <laughs> that's okay. what i got <laughs> right well, it looks like a kelp forest to me because I've got ocean on the brain all the time. Um, so I'm just going to come down here and share our screen and we'll show some images at, as Brian is talking and uh, talk about marine protected areas in California. So we already went through this and I do want to give a shout out to that's Juneteenth. It's uh, we're celebrating freedom for our African-American or black <laughs> Uh, citizens in, in the United States during this time of turmoil, we need to support all of each other. And especially now let's celebrate this, this movement and, and uh, freedom for all peoples and all cultures across the world and the United States. Uh, so this is our talk, our 11th uh, or 12th talk about marine protected areas, what they are and how they work with Ryan Baird. So Brian, you have an incredible history in marine protected areas. And uh, can you just give us a history? Because I know in California, we had some really old ones, like the ones off of La Jolla Canyon, it's next to Scripps Institute, uh, Point Lobos. These are two of my favorite areas to dive as they have been for decades because uh, we always knew they had more fish to look at. And I'm not a fish killer, I'm a fish photographer and fish protector. So I always love to go to La Jolla Cove and La Point Lobos, which were started like in the early 1900s, I think. But right. things really evolved in fits and starts and postage stamps. And there's sort of this uh, disconnection or no uh, non-unity of marine protection in California, even though we did a pretty good at trying. 
So maybe you can kind of walk through us uh, that history. And I, you know, I just sort of put a definition on an international scale that we talked about last week, but maybe we can just start like, what, do you, what is a marine protected area? And then we can go into what it means in California. So thanks, Brian, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, you know, we can go through the definitions of, uh, of what a marine protected area is or what a marine managed area is. Uh, uh, you know, you've, you've got a reasonable definition here that's defined in state law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it'll kind of happen as I discuss the, the history of this. So I think what I'll do, uh, since I have been around for some time, is I'll start back in, in 1990 uh, when there was a real recognition by visionaries in, in ocean management that our overall ocean management, just, just not just this issue, was fragmented and confusing. Uh, we kind of loved it to death. We have all sorts of a huge body of laws and things dealing with fisheries and shoreline erosion and water quality and marine protected areas. There are different laws, different rules and regulations, uh, different agencies, different funding streams. It was kind of a mess. So a visionary and a real mentor to me, Assemblyman and then Congressman Sam Farr, authored the California Ocean uh, Resources Management Act of 1990. What that did is that called for a comprehensive approach to ocean management and how can we look at the big big picture i was hired in 1993 to try to implement this law uh, and uh, i worked with people all up and down the state we had 20 workshops all up and down the state we convened a bazillion meetings and in 1997 we released our document uh, california's ocean resources and agenda for the future which had 35 recommendations on how we look at this big picture in, in ocean management and protection and how the executive branch of state government should, should uh, address this. But a key issue, again, was marine protected areas, which as you pointed out, some uh, were established at the turn of the century. Uh, since that time, anytime there was a place that somebody wanted a little postage stamp area they wanted protected, they would find a law somewhere to do that. And if they couldn't find a law, they'd create one. And so we ended up with what we identified in our ocean agenda as 18 classifications, very complicated. Nobody knew what to do with it. So we convened all the state agencies in California who had jurisdiction over this. And we met for a year and a half to come up with a more structured and effective system. And I wanna do a call out to Melissa Miller Henson who worked for me during that period of time, uh, who really made this happen. She's very, very detailed oriented. And I would come in and make the you know, the, the big picture pronouncements and I would break up fights between the departments when I'd go into these meetings. But Melissa really made this happen. And she's now, I believe, the uh, deputy director of the uh, Fish and Game Commission. And that's a very worthy position for her to be in. She really has been huge. But basically, we and she and this group came up with the, the six uh, areas uh, uh, for the uh, marine protected area classifications. And they are marine reserves, marine parks, marine conservation areas, which are the basic ones that you'll see in the Marine Life Protection Act. But there's also uh, one for cultural preservation and marine recreational preservation and, and water quality. So yeah, there we are. Thank you, David. Um, at the same time, the Marine Life Protection Act passed requiring uh, the state to adopt, um, to identify and adopt a network of marine protected areas uh, in state waters uh, out to three nautical miles. And thanks to assembly members, Kevin Shelley and uh, former speaker pro tem, Fred Keeley uh, for their work and dedication because they brought all this stuff forward. They started working on the body of law to bring some sense, some common sense uh, to all of this. Problem with the Marine Life Protection Act is that it was controversial to implement. It was very expensive to implement, very labor intensive and we were in an economic slowdown in California. So it, making this happen was kind of a nightmare in the beginning. And uh, uh, I think uh, as you look at the history of this, the first two attempts failed and they failed big. It, it, it was too controversial. There was not enough money. There was not enough attention to stakeholder uh, involvement. So the third process and the successful process was driven by a public par private partnership between uh, Secretary for Natural Resources and my boss, Mike Chrisman and Governor Schwarzenegger and also with the Resources Legacy Fund Foundation. And I also wanna call out Michael Mantell, the president of uh, Resources Legacy Fund Foundation and Mike Weber, who's a, a real expert in these issues who are key in crafting this on the foundation side. 
and then uh, Secretary Mike Chrisman, and then many of you know Terry Tamminen, who was the uh, governor's cabinet secretary, who all worked to do this unique thing. We, we could not solve this problem. We could not create this system using old ways of doing business. We had to do really, really different ways of, of, doing, of, of business here. So the Marine Life Protection Act initiative was a, and this is important, a stakeholder driven, but science-based process. So the idea was to bring the stakeholders into the room, uh, the public, fishermen, industry, academia, non-governmental organizations, and, and government. And, and uh, a key aspect of this new process was to break the state into four parts and do regionally, um, you know, do a central coast, do a north coast, do uh, a south coast, et cetera, uh, because you couldn't possibly do this for the whole state at one time. It was, it was just infeasible. So these stakeholders would work together in each region and they would develop and uh, propose uh, marine protected area networks. And then we are so blessed here in California with so much expertise. So every one of these proposals for these networks in these regions were vetted by some of the top scientists, economists, and legal uh, experts in the world. And uh, so th this process, which was so far outside of the Fish and Game Commission's process, was to have in, in a region uh, development proposals or proposals for the, for these MPAs that would go to the Fish and Game Commission. Uh, and uh, the, all these proposals went through what were called Blue Ribbon Task Forces, a very high level of people who, who knew how to get things done. Finally, uh, proposals would, would shift from these regions to the Fish and Game Commission and another public process would happen and another scientific review and economic review and legal review would happen and a whole nother set of, 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 of public input uh, from uh, stakeholders. So the bottom line is we went through this process, which I'll be honest with you, mortified me in the beginning because it was difficult. People would show up at these meetings and they're pissed and they, are, they feel that something is going to be taken away from them. And they did not see any benefit from these areas. And I think what has transpired uh, once we've got through this whole thing was a logical system uh, or network with agencies who understand their roles, with the legislature who understands uh, how the funding streams work for those roles uh, and something that works. And then we're starting to see in the early, early stages now uh, that this is actually producing more fish and, and the boffs, the big fat fertile female fish that everyone wants to see that are, that are that is going to proliferate uh, marine life in, in these areas. So it's, it's, it's been a wonderful thing. It's, uh, it's now a global model. And, uh, but the only way that it's going to continue is to have the ongoing commitment and engagement by the, by the public. So as we go on with this discussion today, I know Nicole's gonna talk about the collaboratives, which are organizations that bring the community to the table to try to keep these, these areas alive and functioning properly. And they will not function properly without that kind of engagement. So that's my overview. Yeah, <clears throat> well, um, I was involved with it in the North Central region. Uh, as you said, there are, were four regions, there are actually five in, under the Marine Life Protection Act. So let's not forget Secretary Laird about San Francisco Bay. <laughs> Every time I go to the OPC, uh, meetings, I come up and he's like, oh no, here comes the San Francisco Bay guy again. Right. Um, so there were five regions and four are actually implemented before we had, as people call it, MPA fatigue. But it really was an interesting process, um, the stakeholder process and uh, people sitting across the table with alternative viewpoints and uh, alternative stakes in the game. Some were recreationists, some were commercial extractors, fishermen and others were recreationists. And what I really saw was how powerful and uh, pretty unified voice of the recreational fishing lobby. And their Me Too's would take hours and they're all wearing the same shirts and coming up. And, and you know, the, I guess the end of the day, it seems like some of these fishermen are now joining in and recognizing that they work. And clearly the science, I and mean, you mentioned earlier, uh, the science, that's a big part of this network of marine protected areas that uh, are connected by the California Coastal Current and also the Davidson Counter Current in Southern California. Uh, so, you know, there are what, 126, I think, or 124? Forget the number. 124. Uh, 124, I believe, Nicole will know. 
Uh, and so they include those red dots, which are no take reserves and then state marine conservation areas, which allows some recreational take. And we'll talk about the different levels of take, but I think what, what really is great about the MLPA is that it's clearly defined, whereas before it really was kind of a mishmash, state parks, uh, county protected areas, right? I mean, you didn't know what the rules were. Right. And, and now it's pretty clear and it's pretty uh, succinct, you know, for a law. <laughs> it's only five pages instead of like 500. <laughs> uh, uh, but so can you can you talk a little bit about the science and how that's monitored, how that was set up, some of the players and, and uh, you know, who's monitoring it now? Are you familiar with? Well, let's let's be 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 clear here. I, I left my position at the resources agency six years ago, so I've been kind of monitoring this from from afar. But I will say that um, organizations like the California Ocean Science Trust, which I, I helped establish, um, uh, has played a huge role in uh, setting up a monitoring framework that that's, that's something that you're going to be able to have a, a baseline for what's been going on in all these areas in the beginning. And then to try to uh, to uh, to see what kind of changes are occurring, and it's extraordinarily complex because we're in the middle of, of these climate change events, which are which water temperatures are changing and current regimes are changing, and so sometimes it's a little difficult to tease out what's doing, you know, what what the genesis of change uh, is. But I, I think the idea is over a long enough period of time, they will be able to tease that out. Uh, but the anecdotal evidence, particularly in Channel Islands, which has had these uh, no-take areas for uh, quite a long time, has, has been pretty, uh, not anecdotal actually, the, the proven, right, that certain species are absolutely doing better. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, to what degree the other sites on the mainland coast uh, are, are uh, you know, how they're performing, I, I just don't know the latest on that, um, so. Yeah, I think, um, well, I, we both went to UC Santa Barbara and uh, I did a lot of my undergraduate work out at the Channel Islands and did a lot of diving. And uh, Jen Cassell, Dr. Jen Cassell, who works at, uh, at UCSB and Pisco, uh, and I kind of, I, I don't want to embarrass myself, Partnership for Interdisciplinary Science, Conservation of the Oceans, um, and, and Mark Carr and Pete Raimundi and Steve Gaines. And, uh, at Santa Barbara and also UC Santa Cruz are monitoring this right. uh, with Ca California Fish and Wildlife. And you know, this, this study is actually that Jen wrote, a decade of protection. So 10 years uh, under the MLP <laughs> Channel Islands showed more fish out inside the reserve versus outside higher biomass. Uh, but also what was interesting was it showed after the big El Nino events, and we lost our, our macrocystis a few years ago during the blob in 2015, 2016, and the undergrowth of sargassum covered a lot of the benthos or the benthic bottom, uh, it, they were more resilient. The macrocystis recovered more quickly, and this ecosystem was more, uh, it, was, it, it was more robust. And so these MPAs have kind of that, an unforeseen benefit. Not only are the fish there, and it's particularly the harvestable species like spiny lobsters and red urchins clearly ex uh, expanded and uh, rebounded very quickly because they were both commercially fished and are benefiting the areas outside the marine protect areas and kind of a spillover effect. But uh, this, this resilience and rebound from these uh, environmental perturbations. So uh, I haven't seen a more recent study there, I know there there are a lot of, a lot of work published, but and in other areas. But uh, I think one of the things that you commented on is really important. Um, Samantha Murray, who was really involved in this with the Ocean Conservancy, then right, yep. and uh, Samantha is a, also a, a JD and a professor, and she's written quite a few articles. And I just read an article that I sent you guys this morning. But what, one thing that I, was, I saw that I wasn't aware of, and it makes sense, so, and you mentioned it, is that the, the MPAs that have financing behind them are more than twice, they're more than double the, to, to be successful. Uh, so it takes money. <laughs> and you know, it takes money to monitor, it takes money for science, and it takes money for, to enforce as well. Uh, so it's, it, I think, it, I mean, I'm really happy to be in a place where we have 16% of our state waters. And as a diver, 
And as part of the Golden Gate MPA Collaborative Network that we'll talk about with Nicole, we are seeing benefits firsthand. I, I just saw, I just dove at the Farallon Islands. Uh, we've been free diving some of the MPAs along the coast here. And there are benefits in recreation. You know, I don't think the, I, I, you know, were you thinking about that? You, you know, I think we're thinking about fish maybe. No, 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 look, we, the, whole, the whole thing with MLPA and, and with going back to, to the ocean agenda, the document that we did our big assessment was we looked at, at the economics of, of ocean management and protection. And, and at the time we did our, our work in like 92, uh, ocean was producing, uh, just ocean dependent industry was producing $17.3 billion a year, which was a big number back then. That number is now, well, I don't know what it's like now with the craziness, but uh, more recent numbers are more like 46 billion dollars that we pump into the, the state economy. Uh, uh, people come to the ocean because they want to see live stuff. They want to see fish that are, are alive. They, they want to swim in waters where they're not going to get sick. Hopefully they're going to be on a beach where the cliff doesn't fall down on them. And we've got some, uh, some controls over that. So the, the economics of all, all of this is key. And I, and I always said when I was assistant secretary that investment in, in, in these protective programs is, is like putting money in the bank. Uh, uh, recreation and tourism was huge. Of our $17.3 billion, $10 billion of that was tourism. We didn't even know how to capture recreation in those days uh, economically. So, this, so anything you can do that, that keeps California being the crown jewel of, uh, of, of, of coastal ocean life in the United States and, and the world is money. It's, it's pure and simple. Uh, okay. So that's interesting. You know, we have a, a question for you yep. from Will McClintock. Yep. And uh, he asked if you could redo the MLPA process differently, would you or how would you? Well, that's a good question. And, and Will was on my national um, advisory committee. So he's poking me here a little probably. But uh, um, that's a very good question. It, it was such a, a complex um, endeavor uh, or, or such a difficult endeavor for such a complex problem. Um, I personally don't know if, if, there's, if there's something that I would point to. Um, you know, I, there definitely were problems. Uh, and, and I think one thing about the regional approach that we took is that uh, after the first one, we realized, oh, there's some things there we're not gonna do again. Um, and that goes back to the first uh, two unsuccessful efforts kind of learned, don't put a bunch of scientists into a room, have them pop out with maps and go talk to the fishing community. That was bad. And that was just not bad, that was scary bad. Don't do that. Um, with regard to, to MLPA, I, I don't know. Uh, I'd be interested if he had any thoughts on, on areas that, that he would improve. He was very responsible, by the way, uh, with Marine Map and these other uh, tools that informed people who were making these uh, recommendations what the, the ramifications of their uh, their recommendations might be, and what some of the economics and the the environmental uh, ramifications could be. Uh, so he he played an important role in this. Uh, that's great. Uh, so if you do have a question, you can put it down in the comments, and we'll try to address those because this is a live program. Thanks for joining us. If you're just coming in, uh, my name's David McGuire. I'm the director of Shark Stewards, and we've been doing these ocean action webinars talking about sharks, talking about fishing, talking about diving, talking about marine protection, and talking about coming together during COVID and working harder for a healthier world and a healthier ocean. Uh, I have Brian Baird here with me, who was the Assistant Secretary of Ocean and Coastal Policy for California, involved deeply with the whole MPA and MLPA process, which is now existing uh, it's been in place for since 1999, I think. Well, the, that's when the legislation passed. Yeah. Yeah, and so some of these, um, it took it takes about it took between three and five years to put these in place. This whole stakeholder process, uh, a lot of commitment, a lot of volunteer time, a lot of late nights and pizza, sitting around drawing, redrawing and redrawing maps, going to the blue panel commission, getting it sent back, saying go try it again. A uh, little arm wrestling about what rocks to protect and what not. Right. Uh, it's very interesting because we work with fishermen, uh, particularly volunteer fishermen, so when we're tagging sharks, 
and, and also leading public trips out to the Farallon Islands. And uh, I charter these fishing boats and uh, these are professional fishermen. And some are pretty happy about it and some are a little disgruntled about it. They wanna go in there and fish and they'd like to see these lines removed or these MPAs removed. Uh, as a conservationist and a scuba diver and a shark lover, I wanna see more protection. <laughs> but you know, it is a public and democratic process and it really was a, an interesting experience in, in sociology, uh, which, and I believe it was very successful and we are seeing the benefits in many of these areas, uh, particularly the Channel Islands, which are the oldest, but also some of the older MPAs along the coastline off of our coast as well. Well, you know, it, 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 it kind of flies in the face of what's happening at the national level right now. And it's- Right, thank you. We wanted to go to that because once you retired and you did your stint at the aquarium in education and trying to support the whole process uh, of marine protection, you became involved with this whole federal process under President Obama. Can you, can you let's, let's talk about that and maybe we can talk about where we are now. Well, uh, I was chair of the, the National Marine Protected Area Advisory uh, Committee, I guess. Uh, Federal Advisory Committee, I always have to think it's a FAC, they call them. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate to have 20 of some of the smartest people in the, the U.S., real experts on a wide variety of issues. And this is a stakeholder-based uh, uh, panel as well, uh, basically experts from a wide variety of of entities uh, ranging anywhere from uh, Surfrider Foundation to the Western States Petroleum Association. Uh, but uh, the, one of the last studies that we did was called Sustaining Marine Protected Area Benefits in a Changing Ocean. And we documented the economic, the environmental, and the cultural benefits of these marine protected areas throughout the country. And they're substantial. And these experts came together and said, we need to support the nation's marine protected areas. As you said, the ones that have the support are the ones that work the best. It's sort of common sense. Uh, we had to deal with emerging uses in these, these areas because these areas don't prohibit the vast majority of uses. They prohibit usually extraction. Uh, and, and we went through a, a wide variety of things, but as we are putting that out that information. We put out that report, and then uh, two months later, the Trump administration eliminated the panel because we don't really need this advice anymore. And that was pretty offensive. And I did write a letter to the Secretary of Commerce, and within 24 hours, I got 29 uh, of these of 60 members. I, can't, I, I mean, it was 24 hours, but I sent out this letter and said, "Please sign on with me." 29 people signed on to a letter to the Secretary of Commerce saying. What is this? This, you know, you no longer need this free expertise. This is not costing the federal government very much money. And basically, they responded that the existing organizations like the Marine Sanctuary Advisory Councils and Pacific Fishery Management Councils and others should provide that function, which made zero sense because they don't deal with these issues in the same way at all. So that was that was pretty bad. And then, and then, like everybody else, I read in the paper last week that. Uh, that the, 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 the uh, administration went in and it opening, is opening up the uh, Northeast Canyon Seamounts uh, Marine National Monument, allowing fishing. They're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be protected. But that, and it took years to make these things happen. And at the stroke of, of, a, of a pen, uh, they're eliminated. And another just huge one, which a lot of people don't realize, is the, uh, the Pew Oceans Commission and the US, U.S. Oceans Commission worked for five years to create what was what I kind of did at the state level, this giant national ocean policy. Uh, the chair of the US Commission, Admiral Watkins, is a Republican. And, and uh, uh, you know, I wondered how that was, how that was gonna go. He, he went with the data, he went with the information. Uh, a couple months into the, this new administration, they just eliminated it with the stroke of a pen. No more national ocean policy. They, they re replaced it with a one page document, which basically says, extraction, extraction, extraction. So uh, it's, a, it, it's a tough time right now. And, and uh, thank God we have so many dedicated people uh, th throughout the US and, and most of the line people in these agencies are really trying to do the right thing. So we need to support them. Yeah, well, and thank you for all that time and, and your service, uh, speaking as a, a full-time ocean volunteer, <laughs> mostly, I, I appreciate 
the effort that you put into it. <laughs> uh, you're retired, but you're not retired. You're still working for the ocean. Clearly, it's something that's very important to you and, and you're passionate about. Thank you. Um, so, so where is that report now? And you know, maybe we could dredge it up again in a few months. Sure. After well, that, yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, the idea of doing that report at the time we did that report was it was a it was a time that we needed twenty experts from around the country to say are, are these things valuable or are they not, and is it just just a, a, a bunch of biologists who think that this is a cool thing or is it good for the environment, the economy, and our cultural heritage. And they found it was good for all three. And they found that it, it could be done for a, a pretty reasonable cost to keep these things uh, uh, going. So, Well, I, I think one of the things we'll talk about with Nicole is, is citizen science and volunteerism and volunteering. And uh, this is a friend of mine, Mike Baird. I want to give a shout out to him. And, we created this uh, thing that I've been supporting called Ocean Sanctuaries, where people can uh, learn how to dive, but also share their information on a common database, uh, much like iNaturalist and uh, the Snapshot of the California Coast and some of these other platforms where people can go out and actually collect data, observe, and support marine protection or species protection. And these guys are actually going and working in, in uh, some of the MPAs in, in Southern California, particularly La Jolla Cove, and also looking at seven gill sharks. And we found that sharks that we tagged in San Francisco Bay were photographed down in La Jolla Cove uh, mm. by these divers. So there are these networks of, of volunteers and also a lot of fishermen um, have been volunteering their efforts, particularly with Rick Starr doing some of the work on the uh, rockfish so a lot of these commercial fishermen are really proficient. They're really good fishermen are actually helping support the science uh, by providing their expertise. Yeah. So uh, I wanna thank you again, Brian, and I hope we can work together on another event, a lecture once we break out of COVID. Uh, I wanna remind everybody to stay safe, wear our masks. I think we're doing a good job in California, but cases are going up, people are coming out so we want to remind everybody to live like a shark. You keep your distance, you keep your fins clean, and you always smile with a mask on. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I want to show a little film that talks about citizen science and the marine protected areas and the, the California Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network. And then we'll talk with Nicole Palma. But uh, in, in this clip, you'll see Cala, who Kala Allison, who's our fearless leader, who's been involved with the marine protected area process as a fish and wildlife officer, I think originally, uh, body surfer, lifeguard, ocean woman out there protecting and kind of keeping this whole network together that we'll talk about. So let me kind of kick out of here. And if you have questions, you can put them in the comments and we'll talk more about policy, how to protect maybe other areas like Region 5 in the San Francisco Bay, which <laughs> deserves protection and a very important nursery and estuary. And, uh, but first let's talk about the coastal process and watch this film on California. <laughs> accomplishments of the collaborative network and something we really value is bringing I think one of the biggest accomplishments of the collaborative uh, network and something we really value is bringing together to people that might not have come together otherwise to think together about together the best way to manage marine protected areas. Bringing the tribes together with agency and enforcement officers, with environmental nonprofits, bringing them together with the fishermen, and bringing the scientists too that can share their perspective. Having all those people at the table and having them feel like their voices are heard and that their voices are valued, that is a huge asset 
that really can't be replicated anywhere else. It needs to be channeled and, and harnessed and leveraged in a way that can really help fish and wildlife do the best job they can. I think we all are very, very concerned about the ocean condition. I mean, this is our livelihood, this is what we do for a living, and we certainly do not want to see any damage done to the ocean in any way. There's a way to work around this stuff. Everybody needs a little bit, you know, we need to give and take. One of the problems we have historically with resource management is that people tend to work in their own little silo. The scientists work on the research and monitoring, enforcement officers just do enforcement, the nonprofits are working on the conservation side, and the fishermen are making a living. And I think it's really important connecting them to the managing agency so they're not all on their own doing separate, disparate things, but they're coming together with the managing agency doing something that's approved, that can actually be supportive. So there's this top-down, bottom-up where we come together and make very valuable products. We make valuable relationships, and we're actually able to leverage not just the natural resources, but the social resources and the value they bring to the table as well. We want to make sure that, that there is really not paper parts, of course. We want to manage them for the long term. And part of that effort is making sure that, that we really start enabling of, communities of, to become of, stewards of their MPAs, and hopefully that spreads beyond the coast and it becomes a part of, of who we are, our coastal stewards. Was a, a short video from the California Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network, and we had Nicole Palma with us. But Nicole, before I bring you on, that film uh, really uh, prompted two questions or thoughts. Um, one was the tribal uh, influence and the tribal engagement. Uh, tribes are some are federally recognized, some like the Chumash are not. Uh, but they were clearly important stakeholders having this traditional use. And uh, Brian, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and particularly the, you know, the Klamath and the Northern tribes were, are heavily involved and, uh, and, and were uh, deep, deeply immersed in that process and obviously could not be excluded. Uh, so I think that's another thing that is unique about marine protected areas and many of the definitions are the value of cultural uh, uses as well as uh, extractive or recreation. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know there's, a, there's always been, a, there's a history, there's a legacy obvious, obviously of colonization and, and abuse of native cultures and, and taking away the lands and, and land use. So uh, I was engaged a little bit, but we didn't really have a lot of tribal influence in the North Central, but clearly in the North and also off Santa Barbara. Yeah. Um... I was involved with some of the North Coast discussions with, with the North Coast tribes, and um, it was a challenge because you've got, uh, well, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think in California, you have about, a, had a, about 160 uh, tribes roughly, and about 100 of them are federally recognized tribes, um, all are sovereign nations. Uh, and so uh, here we are, the state of California, working with these various tribes, and no matter what we do, um, uh, we're working with a fraction of the tribes who were up in that, that region. Uh, thank God there were some really, really progressive tribal people like Hawk Rosales, uh, who I dealt with quite a bit, um, who saw that it, what, what needed to happen was there needed to be documented cultural uses that, that went way back in time, way back into, into the, the culture. 
And um, he actually went to uh, UC Berkeley to the Kroger Library and, and other places and found documentation of what these traditional uses and practices were, um, at least at the time that Kroger was there doing these, these uh, socio and archeological kind of evaluations of what was going on up there. Uh, it was a extraordinarily complex uh, legal situation uh, with regard to how tribal rights relate to, to uh, California state law, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so we were constantly dealing with our, our California state law, tribal culture and, and law and federal law and federal agencies had jurisdiction over all of this because again, these are sovereign nations we're talking about. So this was in the tail end of my career. <laughs> it actually got resolved after I left uh, or as I was leaving uh, the resources agency. But uh, my understanding is that uh, there's a pretty good relationship now with the tribes up there. And again, Nicole, <laughs> we'll get to you, Nicole. Uh, uh, my assumption is that the collaboratives are working with the tribes up there now. And that's really a good thing. There was a lot of very bad blood for a while in this and a lot of suspicion and, and, and alleged racism against the tribes and things in the beginning of the process. And I think it ended up landing pretty well, but uh, uh, maybe Nicole can comment on that. Yeah, we'll get to that, thanks. Uh, Cause it is fascinating and particularly in this today being Juneteenth to recognize the, these culture, these tribes and, and their involvement and their rights as well. And it is an interesting discussion and argument, um, but it appears that there's, there's uh, some progress definitely in the marine protected areas. It's, I mean, clearly I think uh, in the central coast uh, and I'm not sure, not as familiar with the North coast, and, but it, it, it also segues a little bit there. There was something I saw on the MLPA uh, network page, I think it was Facebook, I don't know, Nicole, you can correct me, but it was, I know that there was a, a movement to create another national marine sanctuary. And I think Brian, you were involved with the sanctuaries as well, right. uh, as, as I have been and still am with the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. But uh, there's a proposal to create a Chumash National Marine Sanctuary from, I, I think the Channel Islands or Santa Barbara up to where the Monterey National Marine Sanctuary abuts. Is that right, Nicole? Um, I don't know the exact geographic location of it. That sounds pretty big, um, but it is around the Moro Bay area centered around there. And it's the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. So that is a sanctuary that's been proposed. I believe they're still in the public comment period. There have been a few um, events that have gone on um, to try and push this sanctuary forward. Um, and we, as the collaborative network, uh, share information when we have it. I believe the comment period may actually already be closed, um, but that's something that has been uh, on a topic of conversation recently. Um, and I can share the website here as soon as I, it's just chumashsanctuary.com if anyone's interested. Yeah, it's, um, and it's interesting. It's driven largely by uh, cultural use, a beautiful area of coastline, uh, an important area of coastline. And, that would be our fifth California National Marine Sanctuary. Yeah, California, we're number one. Uh, although that is a federally protected area that has different rules and different management. Uh, and I don't foresee it happening in the next year or so, but I think the public comment was actually to keep it open under consideration for the next five years. And uh, it would be great to see more protection, particularly from resource extraction, like oil drilling, and bottom trawling, which are the main protections that our sanctuaries provide. They do protect whales, of course, through other regulations and have public access, but they don't really manage fisheries. That's under National Marine Fisheries Service, not the sanctuaries. Uh, the other thing, Brian, that I wanted to bring up, and we got to need to move on because we're running out of time, and I want to leave Nicole plenty of time, uh, is Dick Ogg was part of that process. And Brian is also on the board of the International Ocean Film Festival San Francisco. Yay, I've been involved for 15 of the 17 years. It's now online. Uh, Director Anna Blanco and I have been online showing films. If you go to intloceanfilm.org, uh, you can watch films for free from the festival. Please donate to support it because it's a nonprofit. Uh, and Dick Ogg, The Fisherman was a, a really good film and it really didn't talk as much about his marine protected side, his conservation side, although he really 
truly is a conservationist. You saw him in that stakeholder process in the meetings, but he's a really cool guy, a commercial fisherman and a true steward of the ocean. Um, we have another comment before we move on. Aubrey Nicole says, it'd be great to connect the Channel Islands and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, it would connect. Thank you, yes. Aubrey. I'm looking at a map now and you are right, David and Aubrey is a team member of ours who um, has been kind of keeping an eye on this. So thanks, Aubrey. <laughs> yeah, I think it ends, uh, the Monterey goes down to about Ragged Point and the Big Sur coastline. So, I mean, if you've ever driven down Highway 1 or up Highway 1, you'll see one of the most beautiful coastlines on the planet and whales and condors and it's part of our, our national forest and just an extraordinary coastline with some really amazing diving as well. And rugged coastline, which has some of our healthier, healthier fish stocks, especially particularly uh, rockfish I know are, are uh, pretty abundant. There was a big trawling fishery that actually got uh, phased out and uh, is, is now, they're now using different gear rather than bottom trawling. So let's move on to the State Marine Protected Collaborative Network with uh, Nicole Palma. If you're just tuning in, hi, I'm David McGuire with Shark Stewards. Uh, this is our number 12. We started doing these the second weekend to shelter in place. We're no longer shelter in place. We're more like snorkel in place. Uh, we are getting out into the ocean, but we're still being careful as I hope you all are protecting ourselves, protecting each other and working together to protect the ocean. So here's Nicole, she's the program manager of the California Marine Protected Area Network. Uh, before she came, and I think it's like you've been with us a year, Nicole, is that right? Yeah, just a little over a year. Yeah, um, and so we've been working together with our collaborative at the Golden Gate. Uh, you have a, a background in science, a background in education and outreach. Uh, you did some work in your graduate work in the Dry Tortuga, uh, you've got a, definitely a, a great background to do what you're doing. Uh, those, those sets of skills of science and outreach education are really beneficial in communicating the importance of our network marine protected areas and complying with them. And there you've got a Trident from, from uh, Trident now so far, David Lang and Eric, um, and we've been using those in the MPAs and outside the MPAs. We could talk a little bit about that later uh, but why don't we just open it up? Like, what is the Marine Protected Area Collaborative anyway? Yes, great question. And thanks for that intro, David. Um, so the video you showed showed uh, Kala Allison, who is the founder and executive director of the MPA Collaborative Network. Um, and that kind of gave a good uh, preview of the reasoning behind um, the Collaborative Network and kind of how we function. So the statewide... MPA Collaborative Network is an umbrella organization that supports and coordinates the activities of 14 coastal county-based volunteer MPA stakeholder groups. Um, and we call these groups collaboratives. Um, so there are 14 of them. The Golden Gate Collaborative is one, um, as David mentioned. Um, they cover every coastal county. Some are combined, some are split. And they're made up of just Anyone who's interested in joining, they are free volunteer groups um, made up of diverse stakeholders. You know, we try to bring in anyone who is interested, has an opinion, has a stake in marine protected area um, or coastal and ocean uh, conservation, stewardship, management in general. Um, we provide a forum and a structure for diverse stakeholders, everyone from scientists to fishermen and women, tribes, nonprofits, government agencies, ocean business, museum and aquaria, um, volunteers, interested community members, anyone who's interested. Um, we provide that structure um, for them to engage locally in MPA management. Collaboratives carry out um, projects that address local needs. Um, so each collaborative works to get funding and comes up with their own project ideas um, together as a group. And the collaboratives have made everything from locally relevant uh, brochures and booklets to videos to online training modules like the Golden Gate Collaborative have developed um, curriculums for schools, um, teacher toolkits, coloring books, you name it. <laughs> we have all sorts of resources that have been de developed by the collaboratives. Um, 
And then another important aspect of what we do at the collaborative network is we not only provide the structure and support to these on the ground expert groups, but the umbrella organization, that statewide network, we do have a seat in the MPA statewide leadership team. So that is a team of everyone who has any sort of managing jurisdictional um, agency over marine protected areas. That's Fish and Wildlife, Ocean Protection Council, Fish and Game, State Parks, National Park Service, National Marine Sanctuaries, some key nonprofit partners like Resources Legacy Fund, um, and ourselves and tribal representatives as well. So we have a seat on this team. Um, and so we're able to kind of be the link between the on the ground local collaborative groups and the state managing agencies um, at the top. So we share information between the top and bottom and really support that bottom up resource management. Um, so that's just a little bit about what the collaborative network does. I'm happy to answer any more questions. Yeah, well, thank you. I guess we could start with, so who, who is on these collaboratives? What are, who are the representatives? Sure. Um, it's a lot of people that I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, we do have a lot of, you know, the nonprofits, conservation groups, um, government agencies. So everyone from Fish and Wildlife to local municipalities, federal representatives, um, ocean businesses, scuba diving shops, um, museum and aquarium, like the Monterey Bay Aquarium is on there, fishermen and women, um, and tribal representatives as well. So we are always looking to diversify our membership even more. We have some great um, fishermen and women and other consumptive user representation um, in some of the collaboratives, um, but we're always looking to increase that. And we just really provide that um, space for people to come and voice their concerns, talk about what they've been seeing in their MPAs, talk about resources that are needed, um, share updates among all of these people who are working in the same space um, and see how best we can kind of leverage each other's resources um, and really work as a network. Um, so that's another thing we do um, at the statewide level is we connect all of the collaboratives to each other and share information between them as well. So what someone may be doing down in San Diego may be something that is useful for uh, groups up in Del Norte to know about or create a resource that can be shared. And we provide that kind of connective tissue between the local groups and then the statewide level as well. Great, so Alan sent a, a question for your comments. How can, the, we, how can the public get involved? Sure, that's a great question. Um, you can go to our website. It's mpacollaborative.org. I think um, David has a slide up of that. And each collaborative has their own page. Um, you can scroll to collaboratives and there's a drop down um, and just find your local collaborative. And there's all sorts of information there. And right now at the moment, we ask that anyone who wants to be involved, just email the co-chairs. So David is a co-chair of the Golden Gate Collaborative. These are just kind of the leadership roles of the collaboratives. Um, email them, ask to be added to the mailing list, um, and then you will get on that local mailing list and you'll get updates for future meetings. Involvement is free. Um, you can be as engaged as you'd like. You can attend every meeting, be involved in every project, or you can just be on the list and receive the information and the updates and you know never attend a meeting. Um, we're really just a structure for information sharing and uh, providing a way for people to get involved as little or as much as they'd like. Um, soon, eventually, we are going to have an automatic sign up form on those collaborative pages. Um, so you won't have to email the coaches directly to be added to the list. Um, besides that, we do have a statewide newsletter that we send out quarterly that provides updates on our work and our partners um, and the MPA management program in general. Um, and you can sign up for that list as well on our website. Um, that is an automatic sign up newsletter form. So you can be aware, um, updated with what's going on statewide. Great, okay. Um, yeah, speaking, I forgot to mention that uh, Brian Baird was also the, one of the first co-chairs with me in the Golden Gate. MPA Collaborative Network. So another service, Brian, we miss you, but I have two great chairs with uh, Morgan and Paul Hobie. So uh, in, our, in our collaborative, 
many of our MPAs are kind of more remote than some of the MPAs, for example, down in Southern California. And it's really interesting when we all get together and share this information, as you said. Um, for example, in Orange County, there's a lot of agency and uh, uh, government representation, which is great. The lifeguards, there's public safety involved. Like their meetings have a lot of uniforms, uh, whereas ours are, there's very little agency. There's NOAA is involved, the sanctuary is involved uh, in state parks. But, and then in San Mateo, which is just south of us, at the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, they've got, of course, Rob Calla, who's this amazing ranger naturalist, great guy, but also the Friends of Fitzgerald, who are a community group, and they're really involved in trying to educate the public to not love our marine protected areas too much. And we have a little bit of that at Duxbury Reef as well, because people love to go tide pool. It is in the marine conservation area. You're not supposed to take anything out of the tide pool per the regulations, but sometimes people leave the rocks uncovered or they step on some of the animals. So uh, some of these groups are actually coming down and patrolling and educating people in the marine protected areas as part of this collaborative process. Um, so we haven't met because of COVID, but one of the other things, I mean, uh, we haven't met for about six months as a, as a group, but uh, we are all meeting online and talking on Zoom or Zooming to death. Um, but one of the things that's been important is, and one of the goals has been to facilitate compliance. So educating the public as well as letting people know if they are in marine protected areas. And, and one of the things that I, I don't know was mentioned, uh, but it was on those definitions are the special closures. So you want to talk a little, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so special closures are another type of MPA that we have here in California. Um, as Brian mentioned, there are kind of different designations um, and each designation has kind of different rules for what's allowed or not allowed. Special closures um, restrict access in waters adjacent to seabird rookeries or marine mammal haulout sites. So they are specifically um, designated to protect those areas where you see a lot of uh, seabirds and nests, as well as um, congregations of marine mammals. Um, so they're kind of a unique MPA. They just don't allow, you know, boats or people to get within a certain uh, distance of those sites. Uh, and, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that, that we did in our collaborative with Brian was we made a waterproof brochure. Uh, with the maps because we found that, you know, there's no lines painted out there on the ocean. Uh, some of the MPAs are pretty well delineated, like Scripps has some buoys and it says MPA. Uh, but, you know, clearly off our coast where it's really rough most of the year, there's no lines and it's foggy a lot. But what we see on the clear summer days or fall days, that is, that we call it Sharktober when all the sharks come to the Farallons and, and we're working out there. Uh, we see fishermen come in and they are not aware that it's a marine protected area. And it's kind of like a driver's license. When you get the license, you kind of signed off that you're going to obey the regulations, whether you know them or not. But uh, the big part of what we've been involved with is education and giving this brochure. And I found people actually, in one case last year, a guy actually shook a fish off, a lingcod. He was reeling it in. We came in and we had about 30 people because it was one of our natural history tours, whale watch tours. And we're all looking at this guy. And I said, hey, you know, this is a no take zone. You can't fish in here and you could get a, a fine. And by the way, there are these guys up there who are with binoculars uh, and they know your CF number. And he shook it off. He didn't know, he apologized. And, and he's like, well, where can I fish? And our captain was a fisherman. And he's like, just go over there. It's outside the marine protected area. And, and uh, there's a big spot, there's a great spot to fish, fish and the guys went out there. So, you know, we can uh, help facilitate knowledge in a nice way uh, as, as opposed to using the stick all the time. And that's an important role uh, because, it, you know, the ocean is not red out there unless it's a red tide, I guess. Um, but uh, these are no take, no take zones. And one of the other things, we did talk about the National Marine Sanctuary and, and Brian mentioned the Marine National Monument that was established under President Obama in the Northeast Atlantic, those pinnacles that just got opened up by the administration to commercial fishing illegally, most of us think, in violation of the Antiquities Act. Uh, it will be going to court like the Bears Ears, like the uh, Staircase Escalante in Utah. 
and potentially like the Pacific Remote Islands and Papaho now Mokuakea in the Pacific uh, and with Earth Island Institute, we are poised to uh, file suit to maintain those legal protections that are in place from fishing because we know they work. Uh, but so the Farallons are actually uh, a mix of federal and state because they're in our national marine sanctuary, which has its own regulations and the more strict no fishing zones in the, the Farallon Islands. Um, so you had mentioned this. Uh, this was part of the, the grant that we got from the OPC uh, last round. Ocean Protection Council, by the way. So if you Ocean know. Protection Council, thank you. And uh, Brian, this was actually your idea. So you're, it's your fault that now I'm back at this again for the whole state or your credit. <laughs> oh, good. But uh, really I have, to, uh, I have to shout out to my co-chair, Morgan Patton of West Marine Environmental Action Committee who really did the lion's share of the work on this. Uh, so this is an online ambassador toolkit training kit. Brian, have you taken it? I haven't. You haven't? Yeah, I probably flunk. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you better take it and you get a certificate. Oh, so okay. it's nine different modules and it's, it's tailored specifically to our collaborative area, a little bit north, a little bit south. So it's really tailored to our own protected areas around the Golden Gate, Sonoma, San Mateo. But we just applied for a grant to do uh, and received it uh, from the Ocean Protection Council and Coastal Quest to have nine, or not, I'm sorry, four of these nine module or nine component modules. And it's kind of like when you get a traffic ticket, no, it's better. Uh, but you go through this little test uh, quiz. And then once you've completed it, you get a, a certificate that shows you are an MPA ambassador. Ta-da. Nicole, you have anything to add about that? Or the whole ambassador kind of process? Uh, yeah, I mean, the Golden Gate Collaborative has done a lot of uh, work with this, um, you know, creating these MPA ambassadors who can help spread information about them and just make sure people know what they are, where they are, and that way everyone's in compliance. Uh, the online training modules are great. I'd say the, the, it's pretty general um, to the state. It's definitely worth it for anyone to take it who's interested in learning a bit more. Um, I, I believe you will be adding more regional specific modules with this grant. Um, as it is, it takes maybe about 30 minutes or so to go through and become that. There you go. I don't think we, they get a hat if they pass the, the quizzes, but you do get a certificate um, and you can be a, an MPA ambassador. Um, yeah, so th that's just one of the projects that the collaboratives um, have worked on. It's a great one. I also wanted to point out that you mentioned a little bit about enforcement and compliance and kind of the difference in the collaboratives. They all are different. Every area has its own personality. Um, the Orange County Collaborative, Orange County Marine Protected Area Council has been around long before um, the collaborative network. It was kind of what the model um, was for creating this network. Um, I believe it was established in the 90s at some point. Um, yeah, so they, they were kind of the model for the rest of the collaboratives. And so they have some great diverse involvement down there. Um, we are working, the MPA Collaborative Network did receive funding from the Ocean Protection Council to do a compliance initiative where we will be having uh, community compliance workshops in each county um, with the collaboratives that anyone can attend from the area and just kind of share your concerns about what's going on in your MPAs, what you're seeing. Um, and there is funding associated with a project to address um, those concerns that are brought up at the workshop um, that the collaborative will work on. And then after the compliance workshops, we are having allied agency enforcement trainings. So anyone who has jurisdiction, citing authority in or around NPAs, um, these are for enforcement officers, uniformed officers to attend um, and they'll be receiving a training manual that has lots of great information about their local MPAs, pictures, um, codes, and regulations. Um, so it's not just the education outreach, but also enforcement and compliance, and then research and monitoring, um, where collaboratives work on those projects as well. Using those uh, Trident underwater drones we saw, we do have a full program, and every collaborative has access to two of those mini underwater ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. Uh, to do um, their own projects, whether it's research and monitoring or education and outreach. Um, I do have to sign off here in a minute. <laughs> okay. Got to jump to another meeting. But... 
Thanks for having me. Nicole, and we'll have the website at the end. I really appreciate both your participation. Um, Brian, Anna Blanco was on and she said she wanted to call out Martina Polajek from Poland has been following these and Ann Keller, I don't know if you know her from Texas or listening. Uh, hi, Anna, I'm glad you're listening with the International Ocean Film Festival. But we do have a question from Gretchen Kaufman who you'll see on my Zoom. I'm borrowing her from the University of San Francisco where I also teach because I don't have enough money to get a professional account. So donate if you can at the end. Or maybe Caleb will donate some hats once we get all our modules done that everybody statewide in each one of the four areas and maybe number five in the San Francisco day, Bay someday can get an MPA ambassador hat. So Gretchen asks, are there any other MPA collaboratives or networks of MPAs in other states? Good question. Ooh, that is a good question. I'll answer it real quick before I hop off um, and maybe Brian can fill in any blanks. Um, this is a unique model to our knowledge. We are getting um, interest um, from other states, other countries about um, this kind of collaborative network involvement, how to establish it, not just the collaborative network, but the whole MLPA process as a whole. Um, so Kala has been on some panels, met with people from Chile, Canada. Um, we have the NAMPAM, National Marine Protected Area Network. Um, not sure on that acronym, but we, the collaborative network was listed as a solution um, for some of the problems that um, are brought up when it comes to marine protected areas. Um, that was a panel that happened recently. Um, but I got to go. Sorry. Thanks, everyone. Well, <laughs> Take it easy. Bye. Anything to add to that? Uh, just that uh, when we did our, our statewide, I mean, uh, US-wide look at, at, at marine protected areas, um, there's a lot of friends of organizations. There's a lot of things that are similar, but they're very regional in nature. So I, I, don't, I don't think we identified anything that was like a statewide group that was the same. So this is pretty, pretty unique and pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. 16% of state waters. Uh, there was a sustainable development goal 14 that the United Nations and Aichi that had set a goal of 10% by 2020. Globally, we're less than 6%. And the, there is also the, the Convention for Biological Diversity stated a goal of 30% by 2030. So we're a long way off. And unfortunately, under this administration, we may have less. We just uh, lost some protected area that are going to be challenged in court under that Northeast Marine Monument. Uh, the West PAC, the Tuna Commission, that is composed primarily of industry representatives, have petitioned the government to open up the Pacific Remote Islands and the Papahanaumokuakea and Rose Atoll in the Pacific. These are marine national monuments that were established under G.W. Bush in 2005 and 2007 expanded by President Obama, the largest, second and third largest marine protected areas in the world, half the protection, more than half the protection in the Pacific. And with a swoop of a pen, uh, they want to take it away and open it up to fish, to fishing because that's where all the big fish are. That's where the healthy corals are. That's where a lot of Hawaiian cultural heritage is. Uh, these are our national heritage, our global heritage as humans and with Earth Island Institute, we're not gonna let that happen. We're going to fight it in court. And you can support that by going to sharkstewards.org and signing this petition. So thanks, Brian. I wanted to remind everyone about the snapshot for the Cal Coast, which is the collaboratives are participating on. You can download iNaturalist from the California Academy of Sciences. Sciences. It started in, uh, a week ago and it's going through this, all the way through the fall. You can do it safely. You can do it alone and you can collect data in our marine protected areas or along our coastline, take a picture, find out what the animal is. It'll tell you if you don't know or give a suggestion and it'll be vetted by scientists and it will enter a permanent database. So it's a fun way to get into your marine protected areas or your coastline, look around you, explore your natural world and help document it for future science, for future posterity. Uh, so I wanna thank the Ocean Protection Council and Coastal Quest for our grant. Uh, the process started with Brian when he was co-chair with the Golden Gate Marine Protected Area Collaborative for our Ambassador Toolkit. We're going to expand that statewide now this summer and launch the first ones later in the fall and it'll be in full production mode next year. So thanks to uh, Kala, 
Allison and Nicole Palma with the Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network and all the collaborative members. And you can join them. And I wanted to give a shout out to fathers. So happy Father's Day this weekend, Brian. Um, I'm, I'm a father, a proud father. Thank you. <laughs> Don't bite me. Um, it looks just like you. Father's Day dads. <laughs> and to Gabe uh, DeSavario here, who started uh, Spicy Shark and is a supporter of Shark Stewards and also has a discount uh, for Father's Day. And it's a great way to celebrate with some spicy sharks. So don't eat the live ones, eat the spicy shark and leave the live ones in the ocean. And to citizen scientists like Brian or, or Mike Bear uh, with Ocean Sanctuaries, dive in, record some data and protect what you love. So I wanna leave you finally with a note from our friends in China. We do have a network of young, young marine scientists or people who care. We can't go there yet, but there is a movement on marine protection, there are a lot of people who care in all cultures, so this means respect and respect the shark. So let's love each other, let's support each other, let's protect the ocean health and human health and not hate. So happy Juneteenth. I, I, I want to <laughs> happy Bertha, Bill Brick, my board member. I want to shout, give a shout out to my board, our volunteers, and particularly Bill, who helps us write grants and works, us on, works with us on our strategic vision and policy. So thanks to my sponsors and donors and the Earth Island Institute. And most of all, thank you for tuning in to our weekly web, not a webinar, Ocean Action Series. Uh, and see you next week. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Excellent. Bye.